Okay, so we, so as I say, th this is the last talk uh, of the session. Um, the subject today is meditation. And so I'll talk about med meditation to start with, but because this is the last um, uh, talk, I will also go a little bit into where we can go on from here. Because, you know, as I've been saying, you know, this is just a theoretical course and we really need to practice to understand Buddhism. So I'll be talking a little bit more about that. So starting with meditation. So we've said that a lot of our seeing is driven by the three fires of wanting something, which is desire or wanting to get rid of something, which is aversion or anger or ill will and delusion that is not seeing the true reality as it is, not seeing the way things really are. And so with these three fires, the way we see the world is distorted, but we do have an inherent capacity to act in accord with the situation and to be able to see the true nature of reality as it is. You know, we do have that capability. We do not have to be fooled by our delusion, delusive way of seeing things. So for example, you know, delusive way of seeing things, you know, when we desire something, that object acqu uh, acquires a shimmering veil over it. That is an example of a delusion. And, you know, sometimes we don't even realize that, you know, that veil over that object has been put on by our own heart. It doesn't belong to the object. So, you know, that is an example of distortion. So how do we begin to discern that our seeing is distorted? How do we know what it is like to be at one with circumstances as they are? And the tool that is used for this is meditation. And meditation forms the very heart of Buddhism. Uh, Pia Dasi, you know, uh, in another book, um, not the one that I've just mentioned, uh, in another book called The Spectrum of Buddhism, uh, Pia Dasi says that meditation is a state of mental purity where disturbing passions and impulses are calmed down so that the mind becomes unified and collected and enters into a state of clear consciousness and awareness. Now we hear of meditation being used for all sorts of purposes these days. For example, to relieve stress. And uh, I mean, I come across examples of meditation being used to increase producti productivity at work. It's used in various types of therapy. Now, as far as Buddhism is concerned, you know, while all these benefits may accrue, the primary purpose of meditation is first of all, to gain tranquility of the mind, which is called Samatha. And then with this calmness to open up insight into the way things really are which is Vipassana. In other words, this, uh, the sole purpose is to attain unshakable deliverance of the mind, the supreme security that can be obtained by overcoming all mental defilements. So how do we meditate? Now it should be remembered that although in this lesson we are describing a technique, it is like talking about playing the piano, for example, or talking about playing a sport. The only real way is to actually do it rather than talk about it. So in other words, it is a practical skill that has got to be acquired and refined. And we mustn't expect quick results for meditation is really about bringing a real transformation within ourselves and our outlook 
um, as to how we view the world around us. It is a transformation, a complete transformation, and that takes time. So, you know, we must be very patient and we must be determined to put in the necessary effort for um, the res results to come out. And, you know, we're talking about years and years of practice. Uh, you know, these days it's very fashionable to have a quick, um, you know, to learn something quickly. For example, you know, like in TED Talks or, uh, uh, you know, clips that we get, you know, which, uh, uh, you know, which give us uh, some sort of teaching. Um, so, you know, this, this sort of uh, wanting quick results is sort of become the norm uh, in our fast lives these days. Unfortunately, meditation is something that doesn't work like that. Now, when we take up the practice of meditation, even if we do meditation by ourselves at home, ideally we should find a meditation group that we can go to on an occasional basis, say at least once a week, if that is possible. And if that is not possible, because if you do not live near an accessible center, then you should try and join regular retreats of, of a particular group. Um, now, the reason why I say this is because it is very hard to meditate on one's own. And usually the practice of meditation just simply fizzles out if one is practicing on one's own. I mean, you know, by all means, you know, you don't have to go to the uh, group for meditation every day, you know, you can, uh, practice at home, but at least on a regular basis, do make sure that you have a group to go to. And I'll talk about, you know, finding a good group. And it's remarkable, but regularly practicing with others gives a boost to our practice. It's like a sh injection of um, energy in our practice. For the practice to be of real value, the practice should be a regular one. So nothing much will come of it if we only do it when we feel like it. Um, and we should do it at the same time every day. So, and we should establish a definite pattern that suits our nature, our obligations, our circumstances. Um, so for example, you know, for some people, it may work well to do meditation in the mornings uh, before going to work. With others, it may work well if uh, they do meditation after coming from work, having dinner, and then having a, a quiet um, period of meditation. So you can decide what what suits you, but then when you have decided, you stick to that time. Um, and I'll explain in a minute why I, I'm saying that. Now, um, and also, as I said, you know, it's no good just doing it occasionally. So rather than, you know, having a big burst of meditation, say, you know, for an hour and then realizing, you know, we can't carry on, we don't have enough time um, to devote that, uh, that much time to meditation. It's better to be realistic and decide how much time you can uh, spare, you know. If it's 20 minutes, that's fine. It's better that it's 20 minutes regularly than an hour now and then. So, you know, be realistic. Um, now, in my um, uh, practice, uh, we are advised to do meditation one hour a day, um, which is you know, what I do when I, I'm at home. And when I go to, this, um, uh, to our center, the sessions are one and a half hours long. Sometimes it's one hour of meditation with half hour of uh, talk, or, uh, or sometimes it's just one and a half hours of meditation. Uh, but, you know, you don't have to do that. You know, if you're just starting off, you know, 
just be realistic. Just be realistic. What is possible for you, and and but stick to that. Um, now another thing about a regular practice. Yeah, so regular practice means every day, but after seven days in a week, take one day off the practice completely. Have a complete break. Do not do any meditation on that day. You know, take it, and, and, and that should be a set day as well. Do not chop and change. Um, uh, and that uh, really stops meditation being a chore. It, it you know, gives us a well-deserved break if we've been meditating every day. Um, and if uh, we are able to, then we should set up a regular place uh, at home where we can sit for our meditation. You know, if possible, find a quiet place. And if possible, have a Buddha uh, image. Uh, uh, it could be a Buddha statue called Buddha Rupa, or it could be a picture of a Buddha on a postcard, even that is fine. Um, have that that you can sit in front of. And the practice of meditation is to let go of I, myself. And it helps to go with an attitude of willingness to surrender myself into something greater. And therefore it helps to bow before the Buddha figure before starting the meditation because that bowing is an act of surrender to something greater. We're not bowing to Buddha simply out of respect for Buddha, we are bowing to as a sign of surrender into something greater. And you know, we may not like the word surrender. Surrender simply means willingness to let go of my own way of seeing things, of doing things. Because once we start practicing, we find, you know, that is what comes in the way quite often. You know, when we have a set way of doing things and circumstances don't allow it, you know, um, something uncomfortable rises uh, in us. And, and that is really part of the practice. So having the reason why I say we have a regular time and a regular place is because it is a great help because when that time comes from meditation, when we go to the place that we have set up for meditation, our heart is turn, already turned towards meditation and we are, uh, we're already, you know, our heart is ready for meditation when we go to that place and at that time. Sorry, one more thing about um, regular time. Uh, so I've said we have a break uh, once a week, but also it is important to have a break of about week, 10 days or so, every, two or three times a year as well. And again, this is just so that it doesn't become a chore and we, we come back refreshed. So, you know, you can have a break, for example, you know, we've got like, for example, Christmas period coming up and, you know, when everything uh, you know quietens down there, you know we we can let go of the practice of meditation for a few days. Then, for example, or you know you can choose to um, have the break to coincide with uh, if you got children, you know, with their school holidays, so that you can uh, you know spend time with them. So you know do do have these breaks two or three times a year. So, you know, when we start sitting, we can start sitting for short periods, say 15 or 20 minutes, and then we gradually build it up. Uh, now, there's no need, as I say, to do it for one hour like, you know, we do in our group. Um, just, as I say, be realistic of what, what, the time that you can spend regularly. But, you know, if you do build it up and like say I built it up to one hour, uh, then do not sit for more than half an hour without a couple of minutes break. So you sit for half an hour in meditation, then you have 
two or three minutes of break where you can ease your posture, get the blood flowing again. Um, and then you go back into uh, meditation. So, you know, do break up the periods and, you know, don't sit for more than half an hour without a break of two or three minutes. And when we sit, we sit completely still without moving or fidgeting during our sitting period. Uh, and the reason why we sit completely still, um, and this is something that actually we, we need get, uh, to get used to, uh, you know, uh, and, and you know, I'll, I'll be showing you sitting posture in a minute, um, but the reason why um, uh, we sit still and the posture that I'm going to show you is, has been practiced for hundreds of years and it's been shown that we can sit in that posture without moving for half an hour. Um, and, and the reason for keeping completely still is, um, you know, if our body doesn't settle down, you know, if we are just fidgeting, you know, if, if we are feeling, uh, you know, pain here or a pain there, and so we shift, uh, and, th and then we shift again, and then we shift again. If we just keep on shifting, if we do not keep still, then if the body is not still, the mind will not uh, become sti still either. You know, all our attention will be on the body and trying to get it comfortable. So we just get used to sitting still um, for the period of meditation. So, and you know, when we have the breaks, then, you know, we can relax our posture. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I say, it, we can get the blood flowing ready for the next period. Now, we can sit on, on a cushion on a floor, uh, and I'll show you that, uh, but, it is also possible to do meditation on a chair if, for example, you do not find it easy to sit on a cushion on the floor. Um, so, um, and if you if you sit on 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 the floor, then have some sort of cushioning uh, in between. So, for for example, if the place we are sitting is carpeted, that's fine or if it's a hard floor, you can put a folded blanket underneath you. Um, again, uh, I'll, I'll be showing that in the posture. Um, now, as to, uh, as to which, which is preferable if you do have a choice between a cushion and a chair, and the answer is, it is better to sit um, in, uh, on a, cushion or a chair where you are comfortable rather than, um, you know, sit very awkwardly uh, uh, because you, uh, you know, persist in um, say sitting on the floor and you're not flexible enough. Or also, you know, if someone has got issues, you know, with their legs, hips, uh, and they can't sit on the floor, then it's okay to sit uh, on, on the chair. Um, so, um, to answer the question, uh, wh whether we should sit on a cushion or a chair, I would say that if at all possible, try out sitting on a cushion, um, uh, and see how it goes. If we have, if you're not very flexible, we may find it difficult to start with, but you know, as the more we sit, the flexibility will come. Um, and at first, you know, the posture I'm going to show you might look a bit awkward, but, you know, once you get used to it, as I say, it is possible to sit completely still in it for half an hour. So what I'm going to do to show the sitting posture is to show a video. Now in that video, and this video is from one of the past uh, courses that I did. Um, 
it's an immature video, so I've just used the laptop and um, the dimensions of the room were such that I could show the, the whole body at one time. So I'm sh just showing lower part of the body when I'm talking about the lower part of the body, just showing the upper part of the body when I'm talking about the upper part of the body. So I apologize that you don't see the whole body, but uh, uh, you'll get the main points. So I'm going to share the video and hopefully that will work. Uh, when we uh, sit on the floor, uh, if, if it's a hard floor, so my, my, um, I'm sitting on a hard floor actually. If you're sitting on a hard floor, you can use a couple of folded blankets or, or, or a rug to, to give you softness. And then I'm sitting, I'm sitting here on, actually these are foam blocks which are used for yoga, but you don't, you, you don't need those, not necessarily need those. Uh, you could use any cushions. Basically, you just want to get a height uh, that you can sit on, and you have to. Um, you would need to experiment how high it needs to be. Uh, uh, if you're, if you are, generally speaking, if you're stiffer, you might need to sit a little bit higher. So um, before I show you, go into the full position. Uh, just want to explain. Uh, some people do sit cross-legged like this. Uh, generally speaking, in Buddhist meditation, we, we don't sit like that because uh, it's very difficult to keep a stable posture when the knees are in the air like this. So I'll, I'll show you the posture uh, in, in a minute uh, uh, where the knees are actually in touch with the ground. Um, right, so... Uh, what, what we need, um, so wh when we're sitting, we need to, to sit in a stable posture so that we do not move about. Uh, if we are constantly fidgeting and trying to get into a comfortable position, then the mind will not settle down. Therefore, this posture is actually designed uh, uh, or has been tried over hundreds of years, in fact, um, and uh, it, it, once you get used to it, it's possible to remain in this posture for half an hour without moving at all. And that, that should be the aim, to, to be able to sit without moving at all. Now, uh, uh, so, you know, this, this is a very stable posture. If you're not used to it, it may feel awkward, uh, but you can, as I say, you know, you can start off with just about 10, 15, 20 minutes or whatever you can bear to start with and then gradually make that period longer. Uh, so, uh, 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 right now, I, I will show you the, uh, 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 the, uh, the posture for the legs. So what we, so, so for the stability, as I said, we need to be in a stable posture. So for stability, we use three points of contact with the ground. So there's, uh, those would be the two knees uh, on the ground and then the back on the cushion at the back. And then what we do uh, is we uh, take a, uh, one foot above the other one like this. And there, there we are, we've got the, the knees, uh, on the floor, uh, touching the floor, so that gives stability. Uh, and then we've got the back uh, uh, giving the third support. Uh, now, uh, this posture is actually uh, called semi-lotus. There is a lotus posture, full posture, where not only does the, in my case, it's the right leg over left, but also the left goes over right. I can't do it. Uh, most people can't do it actually. And it doesn't matter. This, this, this is good enough. And if you do do this posture, then make sure you alternate which leg is on the top, sometimes the right one, sometimes the left one. Uh, so do alternate. If you find this too difficult, what is possible is also just to leave this on the floor. And that, that is usually much easier for people, but, but do try half lotus if you can. If, uh, if you can get used to it, if you can build up, 
then that's great. And you know, uh, exercises that, uh, that uh, um, stretching exercises are, are very good for giving us a building of flexibility. And you'll find that if you do stretching exercises, it'll help with the sitting posture. Uh, and yoga is ideal for that, in fact. Uh, so if you do yoga, you should find that it's much easier for you to get into this posture. Okay, so here, here too with this posture, we've got three points of contact with the ground, which give us stability. And another option uh, on the floor is to sit on a kneeling posture. So we kneel on the support like this. That's, so this is fine as, as well. It's called Seiza posture in, in Japanese. Um, and here again, you know, we've got the, the knees on the ground uh, and the back on the cushion, which, uh, which gives us stability. It's a very, very stable posture. Okay, so we have, we've now got uh, stability at the base. Okay, so we've got stability at the base. And then what we do um, with the hands is right palm over left with the thumbs touching lightly, resting on the lap. So it should be resting on the lap so that um, it's not then, we're not having to support our arms, you know, then it's, it's much more relaxed if it's supported on the, on the lap. And then as far as the rest of the posture is concerned, the, the, uh, the spine should be straight with the natural curvature as it is. And the head follows the line of the spine. Uh, our hands are like this. And then um, without, without, so uh, what we do with the head is it should be straight. We look straight ahead and then without dropping the head, we just cast our eyes down um, and we do not close the eyes. They are half open or slitted, uh, but not closed. In Buddhist meditation, we do not close the eyes because uh, with, with eyes closed, there's a tendency to go to sleep uh, and that does not help with meditation. Meditation needs alertness. Okay, so that's the posture on the um, cushion. Uh, incidentally, so if you're if you're if you have if you're doing it on a carpet, you may not need a blanket or or, or a rug. Uh, uh, but you know you have to experiment and uh, and experiment with different heights of cushion. You don't need to buy, go out and buy anything special. Just use you know cushions at home. A head looking ahead uh, without dropping the head. Uh, you cast your eyes down. Just make sure the head is not uh, um, sort of dropped forwards. Quite often you do find people sort of, sort of uh, you know, drop their head forward because um, uh, you might, although you might be able to bear that for about half an hour, you know, if you were to go to retreats where you're sitting for long periods, uh, dropping your head means your muscles in the neck are working very hard and they'll get very sore. Whereas if the head is straight, it, it, it's well supported. Okay, so um, I will now just switch off the camera again and I'll just show you the sitting posture on the chair. Uh, uh, and there's only one difference, which is uh, just the feet. Uh, so I'll just show you that. So uh, here again, you know, we did a stable posture. So, um, and, and we have stable posture by having our feet apart and the feet firmly on the uh, on the ground, so that again, you know, the feet firmly on the ground gives us the stability. Um, so, so that's as far as the feet is concerned. And then um, the other thing that I need to tell you, if you're sitting on a chair, is to make sure that your hips, that your hips are higher than your knees. Uh, uh, and I, I have managed to do that by uh, putting a couple of cushions. Here, so I've, I've got this cushion, and so you know, this is actually a wedge that you get for back, which I've covered with um, a cushion cover. So that, that that's quite useful. Uh, but again, don't you don't need to buy it; just a couple of cushions would do. But it's very it's very important to have the hips 
above the knees because that frees up the back and then it's, it's easier to straighten the back. Um, and in fact, you know, if, if I remove the cushions and if I then try to sit on the chair where my hips are not uh, higher than my knees, I'm actually finding it very difficult to straighten my back. So um, always have your hips higher than your knees. It happens naturally on, on, the, on, on the cushions. Uh, uh, so you don't need to worry about that on the cushion, but here on the chair, you do need to make sure. And, and then the rest of the posture is the same, you know, so you've got the feet firmly on the ground uh, and then, you know, the straight back should be straight. Uh, so I go back on the cushion. Uh, Okay, so, uh, so feet firmly on the ground, uh, back straight, head straight, look ahead. Uh, I know, uh, let me just show you my head. Head straight, um, and uh, the, actually the camera is an angle, so you may not be able to see it quite correctly, but my head is straight. Uh, um, and then you look ahead and drop your eyes without moving the head. And again, the head posture uh, is the same. Okay. Okay. So that uh, uh, shows the uh, posture for meditation on cushion and on the chair. Um, you know, if there's quite a lot to take in there. But you know the uh, recording of the class is available on the class uh, uh, website, so you you can always review it there again. Okay, so once you are seated properly, what we do then is to place the awareness on our breathing. So we are aware of breathing in, and we are aware of breathing out. So we breathe in and we are aware of that and we breathe out and we are aware of that. But to aid with that awareness uh, of, to, of putting the awareness on the breath, what we do is we put a count on the out breath. So what we do is we breathe in and then when you breathe out, we put a count. So I, I'll say it loudly, but you just say it inwardly. So breathe in and breathe out. One. Till the whole breath is out. And then a breath in. And breath out to. So the, the count helps us to keep our awareness on the breath. But usually what happens is, although we want to do meditation, although we want our awareness to be on the breath, inevitably thoughts come in. And um, sometimes before we realize it, the train of thoughts has taken us away and we've completely forgotten uh, about awareness of the breath. Uh, and, you know, the interesting thing here is not to say that you will control thoughts because you will never manage that. Uh, and this again shows, you know, that there is no such thing as I, because if there was such thing as an I, and if it was I thinking, then I should be able to control my thoughts but it's something else that's happening there. Uh, it's, 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 it's not really I, we have to discover what it is. Uh, so, you know, the thoughts interfere. And the thing about um, thoughts interfering is not to be too concerned um, uh, that they're interfering. Uh, the, the key is to let go of the thoughts. So I'll just describe, you know, what, what, what we do. So we breathe in and we breathe out one. Two.
And then inevitably a thought comes in and before we realize we're carried away. So, you know, I, I just start thinking, you know, while I'm meditating now, this is the last Tuesday of the class. That means I am going to be free next Tuesday. Now, I've been meaning to see all my friends. Now, next Tuesday might be an opportunity to see them. Now, where will I go? And before we know it, you know, we are in a pub, you know, thinking about uh, uh, our friends. So, you know, this is how thoughts interfere. And, and when that happens, what we do is we go, as soon as we realize that we have been taken away by thoughts, as soon as we realize that, we let go of the thoughts and go back to the count of one. So it'll go like this. One. Two. And then we start thinking and you know, it might be, five minutes before we realize we're drifted away in thoughts. But as soon as the realization comes in, comes in, we put our awareness on the breath and go back to the count of one. So one. And we carry on. Now, if we get to the count of 10, then we don't, don't go beyond 10. We just simply start again at one. Now, the reason for putting the count is not as a goal setting exercise. It is not as if, you know, this week we reach a count of say three and next week we aim for a count of four. Uh, so it's not like that at all. It's not a goal setting exercise. So do not be distracted by the count that you reach. It's simply to aid awareness and to aid awareness in getting back when we have drifted off. So um, do not be too concerned about what count you get to. Sometimes, you know, if we've had a very difficult day and the thoughts are just going on around and around in our whole head, we may not even get beyond one. Do not worry too much about that. The, the um, real benefit comes in actually recognizing that we've drifted away and then letting go of that thought and going back into the awareness of the breath. It is teaching us to be in the moment, that letting go and being in the moment is what matters. So, so that is how meditation is done. So, you know, through a very slow, hard, regular practice, the mind learns to calm down and relax. And you know, eventually one may get to a state where one simply becomes the breathing. There is no doer and there is no doing. And if a sound is heard, one becomes the sound. There is no sense of eye breathing or eye hearing. There is just that flowing with the moment. If it's awareness of the breath, then it's just flowing with the awareness of the breath. And so at, what would happen in our meditation is, at first, it, it, this will just appear as a glimpse. And then we start thinking again, ah, is this it? And, you know, then we start, uh, that, that we've lost it, you know, once we start thinking. But, you know, once we got the glimpse, we, we are aware what it is. And through practice, you know, that, you know, that glimpse that we had becomes longer and longer. So that is the developing calm. And as I've said, the, the, that, this part of the meditation where we are developing calm is called Samatha. And actually this is, Samatha is actually developing this sense of no I. The other part of the meditative process is called Vipassana, the insight meditation. Uh, and this is where the insights open up. And the practice of Vipassana can be started once we're settled into the practice of Samatha. So for example, if we are just starting off um, with meditation, 
then for a few weeks, few months, we just practice samatha and uh, meditation practice should be done under the guidance of a, t- of a teacher because, you know, in this um, uh, uh, practice, uh, particularly in the Vipassana part, you know, all sorts of things come up which we think uh, that this is it when it may not be. So, you know, we do need guidance um, uh, in meditation. So there should be a meditation teacher that guides us. So in Vipassana, the mind is directed towards getting insight into the way things really are and to see if our insights correspond to Buddha's teaching. As I said, it's very easy to misread and misconstrue things during this process. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, you know, the uh, framework of the Buddhist teaching helped there, and also the guidance of, of a teacher helps there. So what happens in uh, Vipassana is that in the calm that we have developed in uh, Samatha, we interpose for example, a teaching that we haven't understood or which a teacher has asked us to investigate. And we interpose that in the calmness. We do not follow it by thought process or by like rational analysis. We just let it be in that calmness and the insights eventually come up about what that teaching, for example, is. Now, you know, it may not happen immediately. It may take months and months of practice for it, for one insight to open up. But, you know, if we carry on with the Vipassana practice under, under guidance, then, you know, it should open up because our teacher will guide us towards it as well. Now, the other thing that could be uh, um, done in Vipassana is, instead of putting, interposing a teaching that we don't understand, we can interpose a um, issue that we constantly have, which is causing us trouble. For example, you know, the, the fires, for example, if you're constantly getting upset and irritated and annoyed with people, and if, if you've just had an incidence of that, we can just open out to that incidence and let it let that energy be there feel that energy you know i give an example of um, you know how i was coming from victoria station uh, and uh, you know stalled to move uh, by a girl and it wasn't really possible to move in that crowded place and you know and, uh, a hot energy rose up in me and then i took that to the meditation and just let it be in the meditation and you know a new insight comes about that particular incidence, and that actually leads to insight about how our um, passions, our fires actually arise and how they could be calmed down as well. Um, So in Vipassana, we can interpose some issue that we have and then let it be and uh, and you know, again, you know, if it's if, it, if it's a long-standing uh, issue that we have, it may take months and months for something to open up. But eventually, we might get an insight into what it is. And so, with this, um, we begin to experience ourselves and the world in a new way where we see relationships and sequences that we had not previously recognized. In in other words, our seeing becomes much broader. And with time, you know, the awareness of this will become very subtle and the bonds of, you know, self-centered ignorance will gradually loosen and we, we will be moving towards the insight of reality. And eventually, you know, we will see the three signs of being, that of impermanence, no I, and suffering. 
and we will start seeing with us teaching in a new profound light. And in fact, you know, just coincidentally, at the start of uh, this uh, session before, I'd actually started uh, talking about the meditation. I was speaking about um, uh, where three signs of being appear in the Buddha's ancient path. And there I read out um, Piyadasi saying, it is Vipassana Bhavna, Bhavna means meditation. It is Vipassana Bhavna, insight meditation, that removes the latent tendencies. So the meditator establishing himself in concentrated calm develops insight. And then it says in Pali, Sabe, san, sabe Sankara Anicca, Sabe Sankara Dukkha, Sabe Dhamma Anatta. You might recognize the words Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta. Anicca is impermanence, Dukkha is suffering, Anatta is no self or no I. So in English, it's translated as all conditioned things, in other words, all phenomena are impermanent, all conditioned things are dukkha or unsatisfactory. All dharma, that is things or phenomena, are without a self, without a soul. So you know, we'll start seeing that. And that is wisdom opening up. And with that, there is less chance of us being you know, bothered by our usual things, the usual fires that bother us. And to conclude this subject of meditation, I just talked about meditation on a cushion or a chair, in other words, sitting meditation. But, you know, as Buddhists, we must take this meditative attitude that we develop on the cushion into our daily life. We give ourselves wholeheartedly into what we are doing at the moment. So if we are cooking, we give ourselves wholeheartedly into cooking. If we are washing up, we give ourselves wholeheartedly into the washing up. And if our thoughts or disturbances come in, we let go of the thoughts or disturbances and go back to the activity wholeheartedly. So with this, we learn to stay aware and focused during rush of our daily life. And, you know, when we see the arising of passions like lust or anger, and then, you know, it becomes possible to notice them without being carried away by them. And so, you know, therefore we then begin to see the nature of these passions and delusions, and we then do not let them interfere with our daily life. And, you know, meditation then becomes uh, 24 hours a day practice. It becomes a natural attitude to how we live. So that's um, meditation. Now, as I said, um, I will give a few hints as to where we can go from here. So, I'll, I'll actually first talk about the theoretical courses available at this society. But as I've said, um, practice and study have to balance themselves. It should not just be study, study, study. So what I, although I'm going to describe what's available at the society, um, I would suggest that after doing this course, you actually go into a Buddhist practice, and I'll talk about how finding a group, finding a traditional practice, um, uh, and not go into another theoretical course straight away. So, but the theoretical courses available at the society are, I'll, I'll mention the two main ones. The first one I'll mention is the first turning of the wheel uh, course. That's the title of the course. And what that course does is it takes the Pali teachings, basically the teachings of the first five talks, and it then uses uh, the Pali canon. The Pal and the Pali canon is basically Buddha's own discourses, Buddha's own words, talking about some of these subjects. And it's a chance to delve into uh, the Buddha's own words um, and seeing what he actually did say about this subject. Um, so, um, 
So that's the first turning of the wheel course. As I say, do not go into it straight away. Do, uh, I would say at least a couple of years of practice before you go there, and then you'll get great benefit from it because, you know, when you read Buddha's words, you know, they will really become alive because you know exactly what, what, what they're talking about through your practice. Otherwise, it's just, you know, more intellectual stuff, you know, which only goes so far. And the second theoretical course that I'll talk about is the Great Way course. Um, the Great Way course is actually the course on Mahayana. Uh, the society doesn't do it as regularly as the first turning of the wheel course or the introducing Buddhism course, but you know, when one is available, uh, uh, the dates will be put up on, uh, on the website. And basically, yes, this course just teaches us about the development of Buddhism into Mahayana and Mahayana's subtle teachings. So those are the theoretical courses. Um, and something else which um, uh, the society does is it holds a summer school. Uh, so what the society does, it, uh, it hires facilities of Royal Agricultural University in Sirencester. Uh, it's, it's in beautiful surroundings with lovely countryside around it. And the summer school is one week residential um, course uh, on Buddhism. And there's chance to hear um, uh, you know, some of these talks on Buddhism uh, and also to practice. Um, but it's not designed as a retreat or anything like that. It's as, it, as the title says, it's a summer school. So it's designed as a semi holiday. So, you know, um, you learn about Buddhism, but there's plenty of free time, you know, where you can go for, for example, walks in the countryside, the, the food uh, at the college is quite good. So it's, it's a semi holiday, giving you a chance to, um, learn about um, Buddhism, uh, you know, with other people who are like-minded. So, you know, look out for it in summer if you're minded to go to this. Um, the dates uh, for next summer should be available on the website very soon. Um, so that, is, those are the theoretical courses. <clears throat> now on the practice side, now, even before you've decided which tradition uh, you're going to follow, you can actually start doing meditation. And the society uh, offers meditation online at lunch times, uh, that's 12.40 p.m. to 1.20 uh, p.m. Uh, that's a lunchtime, 40 minutes session, where you can join in the meditation. Um, and also then there is in-person classes at the society's building in Victoria. And that's on Saturdays uh, from three to 4.30 PM. And if you can come at all to that, I would advise you to go to that because, you know, meditation is okay online. Uh, and, you know, it's something we learned uh, from pandemic uh, to offer these teachings online. But meditation, doing meditation online is only second best. So, you know, if you can, then do go in person. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you're too far from the society, then as I say, do find a group that you can do meditation with. Now, um, as far as which tradition to follow. So I'll talk about, um, you know, Tibetan meditation, Theravada meditation, Zen and Pure Land, which are offered at the society. And the society is actually unique in having all these traditions under one roof. Usually, you know, if you are practicing Tibetan meditation, then you will need to go to a Tibetan center. Um, uh, but at society, you can actually follow any of these four traditions. Uh, um, now, what I would say is you must not mix and match these traditions. You must pick one tradition and then stick with it throughout from the beginning to the end. 
And the reason why I say this is, although, you know, in the end, all the traditions are basically getting to the same place, apart from the very profound difference between Tara and Mahayana that I already talked about, you know, uh, they, uh, you know, in, we, we can say that they're basically getting at the same place. Um, and, uh, but because, you know, Buddhism has spread to different countries and Buddhism has adapted to different cultures and different sensibilities, the way Buddhism is practiced is so different, say, in Tibet compared um, to, uh, in Tibet, well, Tibetan practice, but, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, t Tibetan Buddhism has had to move out of Tibet, um, but, you know, Tibetan practice is completely different from Theravada practice, for example. So, and if you mixed and matched, um, you know, going to these classes, you know, you'd say that you'd go to a few classes of Tibetan Buddhism and go to a few classes of Theravada and a few classes of Zen, then you will end up completely confused. Uh, because although they are aiming towards the same thing, the way the practice is carried out is so different. You, uh, it's just not beneficial to, to, to mix and mesh the classes. So you should pick one tradition. Now, you may already have uh, affinity to a particular tradition, in which case just go for that. Uh, if you do not, and if you're wondering which tradition to follow, and this is you know, a luxury that we have here in the West, because you know, if you're born in Thailand, you'll just follow you know, Thai Buddhism. So in a way, it really doesn't matter which Buddhism you follow, as long as you just keep to that. But since we have that choice, you know, we always want to you know, choose and you know, uh, make sure we have um, made the right choice, etc. So um, what you could do, if you're not sure, and this is the only circumstance where you can go to different classes and I'll say how you do it, is you, know, you can attend classes of the different practices, but what you should do is attend one tradition for a couple of months, and then you can go to another tradition for a couple of months and try it out that way. So again, you know, for a couple of months, just stay with that tradition that you, you want to find out more about. Again, don't mix and match within those two months. And then once you've decided, uh, then you stick with it. So, you know, uh, you, you might then you know, find you've got affinity with a particular tradition. You might find a teacher that you find to be really good. And then, you know, that's the uh, teacher that you'll follow. Um, so, that's, uh, so that's how you could um, decide on which traditional practice to follow. And, you know, all um, at, at the society, you know, we have, teachers coming from, um, you know, backgrounds, uh, um, you know, where, you know, they're authentic teachers. So Tibetan uh, uh, teachers come from Jamyang, for example, Theravada from Amravati, Zen from Zen Center, Pure Land from a temple called Three Wheels, you know, so these are well-recognized Buddhist centers with good lineage. Uh, now, so, and if you, if you were not anywhere near the society, you know, some of these classes are run online, but as I've said before, online only gets you so far, it's second best. So you might want to look for a group that you can attend in person near you. And these days, you know, there's so many Buddhist groups around. So you just really have to um, just, you know, do a bit of research. And one thing that is important in doing research is just to make sure that the tradition that you are going to follow uh, or the center that you're going to follow has a, has a good pedigree in the sense that the teacher of that um, uh, uh, group, um, and you know, Buddhism is still new to, to, to the West. So, you know, chances are that the teacher of that group or, or, or that person's teacher must have come from a traditional practice from one of the Buddhist countries. You know, we, we're still new in the West, 
So, you know, we're still relying on traditional practices coming over. So just make sure there is that pedigree of connection to genuine tradition uh, that links uh, uh, the group and also the teacher, you know, the teacher should also, um, you know, have been appointed by uh, a group uh, uh, with a recognized pedigree. You know, if um, a teacher just sets up on his own, takes, you know, decides to just teach Buddhism on his own, you know, as his own decision, then I'd be very careful of that. Um, uh, it's It's better to, you know, um, make sure that there is good pedigree. So that's how you can go further with the practice. And, you know, if you found um, the course useful uh, and, and there is in, uh, a lot of material on the Buddhist website, you know, do explore the Buddhist website. Um, uh, and, you know, if you found all this useful, then you can consider joining the society because you know it's membership and donations that support the society you know we're, we're able to offer this course because you know people have you know donated to the society so you know do consider membership and donation to the society um you know uh, once you become member uh, you know certain classes are open to the public uh, like for interesting buddhism is open to everywhere uh, to everyone but certain classes, usually the ones that you go into, you know, particular traditional practice, you really have to be a member to attend those classes. Uh, but beyond paying for membership, there is no charges for any classes. The only, the only charge that uh, is payable with what the society offers is for summer school, because, you know, summer school is a residential um, uh, school of one week. Uh, so that's the only one where you have to pay to attend a summer school. But otherwise, you know, everything else is free on the website uh, or, or through the society once you become a member. And uh, there's, uh, as I said, there's a lot of useful material on the website, but the society also has a journal called the Middle Way, which, you know, if you are a member, you will get that and you know there are some very interesting articles and also in you know, the society holds public lectures which you can attend online um, or in person and um, you know into, uh, attending this sort of uh, courses and public lectures is uh, do works okay online actually it's only you know the practice part that where i say it's better to be in person. So, you know, any of these public lectures or courses uh, work very well online, in fact. So, you know, there are public lecture, lectures available um, uh, as well. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, what uh, one, one um, benefit of all these traditions being under one roof is that, um, you know, when we go to the public lectures and when, when we see the articles in the middle way, you know, we see uh, people, uh, teachers from different traditions actually talking about it. Now, um, I've said not, you know, you should only attend one particular tradition. That is not to say that you can't attend public lectures coming, being given by, you know, a Tibetan teacher, for example, if you're practicing Theravada, but you, you can, you know, it's fine with public lectures and it's fine you know with middle way you know reading the middle way where you um come across uh, uh, the writings um from other traditions and you know uh, the beautiful thing about that is that you actually begin to see how we're all what whichever tradition we're talking about actually talking about the same thing so 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 that that's really nice so I hope that helps. Um, um, uh, and uh, so you know, this brings us to the end of the course. I'll just read out two things to end the course before I open uh, for uh, the session for questions or comments. The, uh, I'll just read out two um, things that Buddha said. The first one is, all, uh, Buddha said, all beings 
but all beings have the power and the wisdom of the Tathagata. Tathagata is another appellation for the Buddha. It means thus gone, in other words, gone beyond I. So all beings, but all beings have the power and wisdom of the Tathagata, only they fail to see it because of their sticky attachments. So all that is required for us is to just, you know, have a parting in that cloud of sticky attachments. And with, with that cloud parting, you know, the sun will shine through of its own accord. So that is what is needed. So, and, and the other thing that the Buddha said, and these were his last words on uh, his deathbed. He, Buddha said, impermanent are all compounded things, strive on heedfully. So with those last words of the Buddha, that brings us to the end of this course. And we can now open uh, for questions or comments or uh, anything you want to ask. You can unmute yourself or, the, or put a question in the chat, which oh, won't do the uh, read out. Uh, hello, sir. This is Ajayta here. Yes, hello. Hello, hello sir. Uh, sir I, I wanted to ask you, how do we overcome depression and anxiety in our daily lives? We, uh, so how do we overcome this problem? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, Buddhism does enable us to, to, to deal with that. But, you know, anxiety uh, and depression are really big issues. And uh, he, the practice is very slow practice. And the practice, uh, we have to start working with things that are not as major as that because, you know, the energy contained in anxiety and depression is such that, you know, when we start off with Buddhism, it's just too great for us to handle. Um, so, um, really, there is no immediate answer to that in Buddhism because it's a slow practice. But, you know, if we practice, we come to a point where anxiety that might have bothered us for our whole lives, will we will understand what it is. Um, so, so Buddhism does get us to that point, but it is a very slow process. So, you know, if people do have uh, immediate uh, need um, for answers, then really alongside starting Buddhist practice, where we start working with the passions, we do need, you know, other uh, avenues, uh, you know, like, you know, a psychotherapist, psychologist, or, you know, psychotherapy, whatever is suitable for, uh, for us, if it is, if the condition is so bad that we need help. And then, you know, when we are, um, be, being given help and safe if the condition is such so bad for example if depression is so bad that we are prescribed medication then you know we must not give that up just because we are practicing buddhism because uh, you know as i say you we do not have answers straight away with buddhist practice it's, it's a slow practice so you know don't give up on any buddhist uh, any any interventions medical interventions for example if there are any being offered, you can do the two in parallel, um, but do not give up on the medical side, um, you know, uh, uh, just because you, just because one has embarked on Buddhist practice. So, uh, um, it, uh, yeah, do, do not expect quick answers, unfortunately, with that. Yeah. Okay, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Rohit. Uh, I have a few questions here in the chat. Yeah. Okay. The first one is, uh, can you clarify the breathing during meditation, please? Yeah. Nose and mouth, or is it okay to use nose only? Um, I'm just trying to think. I, I, I um, only breathe in and out through the nose. And I would think that <clears throat> it's probably a, a more advisable than uh, bringing through, uh, breathing through the mouth. Um, 
until unless you know you've got a blocked nose and you just can't help it or if there's any other reason um, the, then it's fine but i would advise breathing in and out through the nose yeah. okay the next one is i i have a painful joint is it possible to meditate lying down Okay, um, the problem with lying down is uh, it sends us to sleep very easily. Uh, so that you'd face that difficulty. Um, if there is no other option, then I would say do that. But the other option you can have is, you know, uh, if you sit on the chair with supports uh, with with suitable supports uh, so that uh, you know you, the, so that you can sit and and you know if there are conditions like that that prevent you from sitting still for half an hour then sit still for maybe 10 minutes or whatever you can and then you know do whatever exercises you might to just uh, uh, relieve you know whatever um, pain comes up uh, so my advice would be to try um, uh, sitting with some sort of support, try and figure it out, perhaps with help of a, a, a physiotherapist if, if need be, um, and only as a last resort, do it lying down. Yeah? Okay. Can I do... Read the next question. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay. So shall, yeah. I ask, shall I ask Andrew? Uh, he's got his hand up, and then. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then you can ask that question. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, um, and thanks for the course. It's been excellent. Uh, Rohit, right um, my question is about sort of trying to gain insight during meditation. So the vipassana part. Yeah. Um, I've been practicing now for quite some time on my own and in a group, but. Um, the sort of, I've been sort of watching my breath um, mostly. Yeah. And then I was just wondering about the insight and how you do, you, do you decide before you start a session what you want to gain or do you just allow your mind to kind of uh, move towards something? Because I suppose recently I've been quite preoccupied with something yeah. in my life and so my mind naturally kind of moves towards that and I yeah. I sort of I've been trying to allow it but then move back to my breathing but if yeah. I want to gain deeper insight into this thing that I'm preoccupied by yeah and I want to examine it within yeah. my meditative practice yeah I'm just wondering you know how, how how you go about that yeah so um yeah, um, you, you know, you, you, you can decide beforehand what you want to investigate in Vipassana. So in your case, you know, you, you've got an obvious thing to, to investigate. Um, so, uh, and, and if, it's, if, it, if it's a long-standing thing, um, then, you know, in that calmness, just just let it be in that calmness. Uh, just just feel it, you know, does it, you know, if that issue is causing um, some sort of uh, um, energy in your body that you can you, that you can feel, you know, sometimes you know when there's, for example, if there's anxiety or fear, we can feel it in the in our stomach. Um, you know, feel that, and then you know, just let it be, just let it be, and uh, 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 and just be aware it is there. And in that quietness, you know, if it's something long-standing, it may take a long, long time for it to open up. But you know, if you're practicing, you, you know, if you've got the Buddhist background, um, you know, doctrine uh, that you know, in our view, you know, the basic framework, you know, suddenly, you know, you know, some some insight might arise. And what I've said previously um, is. You know, we do not follow it in any analytical way. Uh, in other words, we do not analyze it through logic uh, or rationally. And the reason for that is when we have a, a rational framework or a logical framework, it is something, you know, that we may have built up through our lifetime, you know, through our schooling, through our experiences. 
but it is a framework that we always then use to see the world through that framework. And um, we actually don't know how to see beyond that framework because that's all that we are aware of as I, you know, when, when that I is there, that is all we are aware of. Whereas what Buddhism is getting us to do is to look beyond that self-imposed framework because that self-imposed framework itself is stopping us from the wider seeing. So uh, that's, that's the reason why, you know, analytical um, uh, 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 or rational thinking in the Vipassana process doesn't get us very far. Uh, you know, we'll just be repeating the same arguments over and over again. You know, for example, you know, if we got angry with someone, we'll only see the reason why we were right to get angry and uh, we won't see a bigger picture. So uh, uh, that's why you don't follow in that Vipassana phase, the analytic, in, analytical process is not rational. Uh, you just let it be. And as I've said, um, it is very useful to have a teacher. So if, if you're going to a group and if there's a teacher, you know, and if you feel that you can talk to that teacher about it, you know, do talk to, if it's, it's, a, if it's an experienced teacher, then he or she may guide you into looking into this particular issue. Yeah. Okay. And, and let's say you, you, you're allowing it and you're experiencing it, but you start to go into a bit of a pattern of rumination and unhelpful thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Should you just let try and let it go then and, and return to your breathing? Or, or... Yeah. So, so in the beginning, that's where it will go. It will go into rumination. And, and so rumination is just, you know, repeating, as I say, uh, we'll just be repeating the same thing over and over again, according to our framework. So, so um, uh, uh, if, if you just keep on, if you're just keeping on ruminating and, 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 and therefore your mind is not calm anymore, then yeah, go back into Samatha practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it does need a skill to be built up to stay with that issue in the Vipassana practice, you know, as I said, it's a skill we develop. It's, you know, like, like we learn to play a sport or we learn to play a piano. Meditation is a skill we're developing. So, you know, be patient, uh, uh, you know, uh, answers don't come very quickly, unfortunately. Uh, uh, but then when they do come, they're completely transformative. You know, they're, they're, that's the beauty of it. And also I'll say one other thing here, um, not, not in relation to your question, but as I say, you know, it's a slow practice. Um, uh, the deep insight um, uh, may take a long, long time to come through, but that does not mean that all the time in the practice is wasted because we will soon get into uh, a place, uh, even though we may not understand deeper teachings, we may soon get into a place where some of the um, lesser um, fires uh, don't interfere with our um, uh, daily act activity. So those fires might arise. We might be aware that that fire is there, yet you know, we, we acquire an ability to carry on without those fires interfering. So, you know, and that, that um, comes about fairly quickly, actually. Um, so really that is, uh, you know, I would say a, a, an immediate uh, or reasonably immediate prize of, of Buddhism, uh, even though, you know, the ultimate um, uh, insight might take a long time. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Rohit. Okay. Wong Du? Um, oh, okay. Uh, next question is, uh, can you please repeat the three things, impermanence, no I equal, and the third thing? Uh, suffering. So, so the three signs of being. I'll just read it out again uh, from this book. Uh, old conditioned things. So conditioned things are the pictures in our mind. You, know, you, can, you can put it that way. So you know, the pictures in our mind, all conditioned things are impermanent. All conditioned things are dukkha or unsatisfactory. All conditioned things are without a self. Okay, so those are the three things. Um, uh, those are the three signs of being. Okay, the next is, how about Diamond Way Buddhist Center in St. Albans? Any good? 
Well, sorry, uh, say the name again. Diamond Way. Diamond. Diamond. Okay. Diamond Way. Okay, I personally don't know the center, so uh, unfortunately I can't comment on it. Incidentally, there is the Buddhist Society publishes a directory, and Wongdu can perhaps tell us. So, Wongdu, is the Buddhist Society directory uh, quite recent, or is it now a few years old? Or uh, we we have uh, one online, which is updated one. The, the, the published one is quite old. Oh, the okay. Book. Oh, that's yeah. oh, that's fantastic. So, there is a Buddhist Society directory directory online which gives various Buddhist groups in this country, uh, well, in, in United Kingdom, I think. Um, yeah, but I'm not really sure whether it's uh, publicly available yet or not, because it's okay. online. Uh, I, will, I will check with Odin. Okay, but if it's not available online, can people ask you about a center in a particular part of the country? Can they email uh, the society and ask? Uh, yeah, Odin just told me that it will be available soon, so it's on the directory oh. online directory. Oh, 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 okay. So it should be available soon. You, you, you yes. can uh, email the society and ask for a center near you. Now, one thing I've got to say is although the society can, um, uh, um, you know, affirm the centers that they work with, uh, um, you know, so I mentioned, you know, Jamyang and uh, um, <coughs> Amravati. Amravati is uh, somewhere, it is near St. Albans, in fact, uh, 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 um, and the Zen Center, which is in London and in Luton. So, you know, the society can vouch for those teachers, you know, that the society uses it itself. But although the society has this directory, it cannot really vouch for all the centers, you know, that to undertake that task would be almost, uh, well, very difficult with the resources of the society. So it cannot vouch for the centers. It's just simply a listing. Um, but you know, some of many of those centers would be very, very good centers actually. But then you would have to investigate that for yourself. Okay. The next is uh, Would you, Rohit, be happy to share how you pick the tradition you follow? You follow? What yeah. process did uh, you follow? Only yeah. so we can learn about from your journey. Yeah, so uh, I have been following Zen Buddhism for about 30 odd years. Um, so uh, actually I was not born as a Buddhist. Um, I was born in uh, Indian religion called Jainism. Uh, but, you know, like it happens very often in this country, you know, with Christians as well, you know, when I was brought up, I really did not know a lot of, about Jainism. You know, I'd go to various, uh, um, you know, festivals and things, and uh, th that was about it. You know, I had no deep insight or knowledge uh, about Jainism. And there came a period in my life when uh, I was looking for religion. So I started reading widely about religion um, besides Buddhism. But um, of all the religions I read, Buddhis Buddhism, uh, you know, uh, I'd say made sense to me. Uh, so I decided to follow that. And in fact, I started with this very class at the society 30 odd years ago. And then actually in my reading, uh, you know, prior to starting that class, and as I said, I was reading a lot about religion. I had read a lot about Zen and um, that actually fascinated me, you know, the, the reading that I'd done. So um, after uh, introducing Buddhism class, um, uh, I, I, did, I did the meditation classes and then I also joined the Zen class. Uh, and I heard uh, a teacher, Venerable Mio Kiyoni, uh, who's now passed away, and immediately on hearing her, I decided this is it. Um, and then, you know, I, I did not have to look anywhere, anywhere else and just steadfastly, you know, just followed that. And, you know, it's, it takes, as I say, it takes years and years of practice before insight opens up, but it does open up if, uh, you know, one carries on practicing diligently. So yeah, my 
you know, my Buddhism actually started with the society. Um, okay, Roy, I've got one more here. Can you please clarify the opening of the eyes during meditation? How can I keep my eyes half open? Okay. Half open. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, people people do have difficulty with this. So um, if if you look at any Buddha images, if you look very closely, Buddha's eyes are never closed. They are sort of cast down or, or slitted. You know, slightly slitted. Uh, so they're just a slit, um, and so you can see. You know the pupils of the eye, for example. Um, so, uh, and we do the same, you know, uh, uh, we do not close the eye, just, just, just cast it down, relax the eyelids, and there, there, there would be light coming through, which might disturb you to start with, but like everything else, you know, you get used to it and then you don't even think about it. So, so just cast your eyes down, relax the lid, um, just a little bit of, just light, slightly open eyes and, and you'll see light coming through um, and just get used to it. That's all I can say really. Don't, don't get used to closing the eyes because if you get used to closing the eyes, then it'd be very difficult then to change to having the eyes slightly open. Any other? Uh, I just got one more here. Just got it. Uh, May I ask if Zen Buddhists are required to be vegetarian? Okay. Now, um, Zen monks definitely are uh, uh, in Zen monasteries vegetarians. Uh, so Zen monasteries are vegetarians, uh, is vegetarian. Um, uh, but, you know, um, as Zen Buddhist, as, as a lay person, you don't have to be vegetarian. You can eat meat. Uh, so in Japan, you know, where Zen is practiced, you know, everyone eats meat apart from in the monasteries. Uh, so, that, so that is um, as far as Zen is concerned. And in, in, if, in fact, if I can widen out this question to all the Buddhist traditions, actually, you know, there's a, in a way, there's a misunderstanding in the West where people think that Buddhism is a vegetarian religion. It's not. You know, Buddhist people in Thailand, in Burma, uh, in Tibet, all, all, all Buddhist countries, uh, lay people eat meat. And in some countries, for example, Burma, if uh, a monk is offered in their arms round meat, they would eat meat. So um, uh, Buddhism is actually not a vegetarian uh, religion. And, you know, we have to understand that it's only economically, it has only been possible to become vegetarian in recent times, you know, in previous times, you know, we had, you know, the uh, economic situations of the country's walls, just, uh, and, and the culture as well, was that it, it would have been meat eating and, and for, uh, and Buddhism is a flexible religion. It would not impose outside conditions. Um, uh, and there's a very good reason for it because, uh, you know, the the religion has to be open to what it finds in its present situation. And if it found, you know, for example, if people were eating meat uh, and economically, culturally, it would not have been possible to um, be vegetarian, then, uh, you know, if, and if on the other hand, Buddhism had said that we have to be vegetarian, then maybe Buddhism may not have flourished so easily. And, and, and um, particularly in Tibet, you know, where, uh, uh, you know, there's been a great flowering of Buddhism, but, you know, in uh, Tibet, uh, you know, vegetables uh, do not grow as easily as in other places. They are not available as easily uh, as in other places. So it, you know, if Buddhism had insisted on people being vegetarian, it may not have, um, you know, gone into that country. So, you know, so B B Buddhism is not a vegetarian religion. However, you know, because our conditions today allow us to be vegetarian, if you choose to be vegetarian, then that's very good. But, you know, do not um, sort of uh, misconstrue from that, that Buddh Buddhist religion is a vegetarian religion. Okay. Um, 
Is, are, are there any other questions? I said I don't have any questions. Okay. 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 Fine. So um, thank you very much for staying with the course. Uh, and uh, all that remains for me to, uh, to do is to wish you joy and warmth on walking the Buddha's way.